Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I'm not sure what the uh, Spanish evidence I'm going to. Okay, well, well maybe I will do some very Spanish things. <laughs> Um, first of all, I have uh, bad news and good news. Um, the bad news um, is that I have, I'm going to make very similar points as, uh, as the points that Bruce made. Um, so, um, so you've heard many of them before. The good news um, is that I'll be making them based on um, uh, very different evidence. So we find this convergence of evidence on very similar kinds of conclusions, which means that we're probably right. Um, and so it's probably <laughs> worth hearing again. <laughs> okay. So, let's see how this looks. So, we, you pro probably all know this, but um, it's, it's been argued that uh, written language may be one of the greatest of human inventions. Um, and this is because uh, written language allows us to communicate our thoughts and our ideas to people who aren't present in the same place we are or at the same time. Uh, where we are, and um, it's this ability to communicate, communicate across time and space that's allowed for the accumulation of knowledge. And it's the accumulation of knowledge that's allowed for literature, commerce, science, really the key components of civilization as we know it. And Abraham Lincoln said this very eloquently when he said, writing is the great invention of the world, enabling us to converse with the dead, the absent, and the unborn at all distances of time and space. Now, Certainly we continue to use written language, but you may wonder in the age of cell phones and Siri whether maybe written language is diminishing uh, in its importance or in its widespread use. Well, take a look. It is maddening for everyone else. It is an epidemic, texting while walking. Okay, you get the point. You may have observed some of these things yourself. So it's not just anecdotal. In my lab, we've um, collected data on um, language use in everyday life, how much uh, people use different types of language, spoken language, written language, speaking, uh, writing, uh, et cetera. And what we find is that um, uh, written language use actually is increasing. And uh, this is not because people are writing long letters home on nice stationary. Uh, it is because of the electronic media that allows for all the texting and uh, emailing that, that we now do. Um, so written language um, uh, is certainly uh, continues to be just as important despite Siri. And the fact that we are such expert written language users raises some interesting questions about uh, written language in the brain. Um, as Bruce said, um, you know, there are a number of skills like spoken language, object recognition, navigation, and attention that are what we might call evolutionarily old skills. So these are skills that have been around for a long time. They've had time to, um, throughout evolutionary, they have an evolutionary course that has allowed them to shape um, the genome and has uh, created genetic code for building brain areas that um, allow us to um, build brain, design our brain in order to carry out these functions. But written language is evolutionarily recent. Um, it's only been around for a few thousand years and only been wi widely used um, for a much shorter period of time. And so the, the way our brain uses written language can't be based on specifically designed circuits. And in fact, this is the question. You know, how does the human brain incorporate skills like reading and writing that aren't specifically based on a genetic blueprint. And can we learn anything about written language um, for the context, especially of the science of learning, from understanding how it is that the brain incorporates these written language skills and allows us to attain expertise uh, in these areas? Um, what I'd like to do is talk about three lessons, and these are the ones that are very similar, I think, to um, the lessons that uh, Bruce um, reviewed. Um, these are, um, as Barry said, I was working in special education for quite a while before I came to um, graduate school and I was thinking back through my work now, which is really quite different, and, and trying to think about what are some of the things that I've learned from my work, which I think might be relevant to um, understanding 
um, written language in the context of science of learning. And so what I'll do is I'll talk about these three lessons and I'll give, for each one, I'll give an example um, from my own research, although there's been, of course, lots of other research um, on these, uh, with other different methods on these, on these issues. And my research is a little different from um, what we heard from Bruce in that I work primarily on spelling instead of reading. Um, and the work that I'll be talking about is with adults um, as opposed to children. And I also work with um, individuals, adults, who have suffered brain damage usually as a result of strokes. And I look at the, and I will, some of the research that I'll talk about has to do with recovery of function um, after stroke. So I'm going to talk about a method for evaluating brain activity that's called resting state fMRI. And it's, different from any other neuroimaging methods, um, including the electrical recording methods that Bruce talked about. Um, so those methods typically involve people performing a task while their brain activity is being measured, and the goal is to try to um, understand the relationship between the brain activity that's being measured and the task that people are performing, whether it's reading or spelling or um, you know, phonological processing, et cetera. In resting state fMRI, we use the same type of scanning, but instead of performing a task in the scanner, uh, participants just lie in the scanner in a relaxed, awake state, and usually with their eyes open. Um, and uh, brain activity is being recorded from, is this showing up? I can't see. Is there a little thing? Anyways, I can do it here. So brain activity is being recorded from every part of the brain while people are lying um, in this uh, relaxed state. And although there are many, and, and what's being recorded is the changes in, in neural signal that uh, are produced over time. And so the amount of time that they're being recorded can vary, but let's say between four and 20 minutes would be pretty typical. And, and, the, and one way in which the data can be analyzed is to um, look at how uh, look at the patterns of activation in different brain areas over this time period to see how similar or different the activity of the brain areas, the activity of the brain areas um, is while the brain is in this relaxed um, state. So for example, uh, these are two brain areas here. This is a signal that's being recorded from, that was recorded from this brain area during some period of time, the signal that was recorded from this brain area during a period of time, and then we can correlate these uh, fluctuating signals to see how similar they are and get a correlation value that represents the similarity of the response of the two brain areas with the brain at rest. Now, why would we, why would we be interested in looking at brain activity in a brain that's at rest? Um, and it turns out that um, it wasn't maybe obvious before this type of work began, but it turns out that um, the, brain at the activity of the brain at rest can reveal um, aspects of the underlying connectivity patterns of these brain regions when they're not even engaged in a task and tell us something, if you wish, sort of about the deep structure of how these brain areas are related to one another. And when I say connectivity, I don't mean the physical connections between the brain areas, the fiber paths that connect them. What I'm referring to is the connectivity in terms of their function, in terms of their activity. And what we assume is that brain areas whose activity at rest is correlated are brain areas that are related in terms of the functions that they perform. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about a study that, that we've carried out. What you have here on the left are a number of locations that are in what we call the orthographic processing network. These are key nodes of the orthographic processing network. And these have been determined from other studies, not the resting state study, so uh, fMRI studies uh, mainly. And so what you have here in red are key, uh, blue are key areas in reading, and you've seen some of these areas that Bruce talked about. You have in red areas that are involved in spelling, and in purple areas that are uh, involved in both. And I'll just draw your attention to this area, which is one of the areas that Bruce spoke about, this um, mid left hemisphere, mid fusiform gyrus area. And you can see here, although the color is not great, but this is actually a purple area. So one of the things that we've learned in my research and, and those of others who've worked on spelling is that this area is not only involved in reading, which it certainly is, but it's also involved in spelling. And that raises some interesting questions about how to think about uh, the representation and processing, processing in this area that we won't have time to talk about, but I did want to draw your attention to that. So in our resting state fMRI study, we looked at the activations of these pairs of areas, uh, for every pair of areas in the um, orthographic processing network, and we correlated the the, the, their act, the activation patterns in the brain at rest. And we can depict the results um, in this uh, figure on the right here. 
So these are these same 13 areas, and they're connected by bars, um, and the color of the bar indicates the strength of the correlation of the resting state activity between these areas. Now, every area has some correlation with every other area, and so what we've depicted here are the correlation values that are above average um, for this network. And there's just a couple things that I'd like to point out to you. Um, one is that you can see that some areas are connected with red and other areas are connected with you know the colder colors. So for example you can see this area in here where you have this kind of triangle here that has very strong connections or very similar activation patterns at rest and you have other areas such as for example here where the areas do are certainly have similarity of their patterns at rest but they're much less similar at rest than other areas. So Areas are not homogeneously um, connected to one another. They're all areas with an orthographic processing network, but you see differences internal to that network in terms of the way the areas uh, connect to each other. And the other thing you might notice is that there's some areas that have strong connections to many other areas. So for example, here you see you know, seven or eight colored connections, and you have other areas that have only a couple of strong connections to other areas within the orthographic processing network. And this illustrates the point that this network is not homogeneous. You have heterogeneity within the structure, um, but within, within the network. And what we did to better understand this heterogeneity is do um, a hierarchical clustering analysis where we took the correlation values for every pair of ROIs, of, of regions of interest, or these nodes uh, within the orthographic processing network, and they were analyzed with this hierarchical clustering uh, analysis approach. And what this does is it takes these values and groups areas in terms of the similarity of their, of their responses to one another and also dissimilarity to others. And what we find are four clusters. You can see here the four clusters of areas. These, these um, abbreviations correspond to each of the 13 uh, areas of the uh, orthographic processing network. And when we look at the, the cl these clusters, what we find is they correspond to um, familiar sort of uh, general purpose functions like auditory or audition, uh, phonology as Bruce talked about, visual spatial attention, motor planning, and language. So what we find is that the, orthographing proce the orthographic processing network, even at rest, or at rest, reveals its internal structure. And its internal structure is that there are multiple components that form a part of this orthographic processing network. And what that in terms of the lesson that tells us is that reading and spelling are not a single function. It's not that you learn a complex task, but that's reading or spelling, but instead it's really a multi-componential task, and what we need to learn, or at least part of what needs to be learned, is how to integrate across these various functions. And these functions uh, include, as Bruce mentioned, vision and language, but they also include, include attention and motor processing. So we have multi -compo multiple components that need to be integrated, and that's part of the big learning challenge of learning how to read and spell. And that's true whether we look at the orthographic processing network as a whole, like I did here, or whether we look at reading and spelling networks separately. They're all multi-componential that require integration for expert um, processing. So we, we, we know that we need to integrate across multiple systems, and uh, one of the questions that comes up is, well, what is the content of what needs to be integrated? So what exactly is going on in each of these systems um, that needs to be integrated? And um, what we've learned um, is that um, what the brain has developed is, very, is a great deal of specialization and actually specialized subsystems um, that require this integration, and I'll present um, some evidence of, of that. But you know, reading, uh, as, as Bruce also mentioned, seems effortless when you know how to do it. So you're looking at the words on this slide, and they're just there for you. you. You don't feel like you're making any effort. In fact, you can't even help but reading them. You know, we know that when words are presented before people's eyes, they extract the meaning automatically. They can't even not uh, process the meanings of words. And so sometimes we might lose track of how complex the process is and how much specialized learning is required. But if I show you text in languages that you might not know, for example, Chinese, for those who aren't Chinese readers, um, or Arabic, okay? And you look at this and you realize this, to, to achieve the same level of automatic recognition in a text really is quite a task. And it requires specialization at so many levels. You need to learn new letter shapes. You need to learn about the elements that compose the words. You need to learn how to direct your attention across the page from right to left to left to right within each of the structures. There's also differential um, allocation of attention. So, we know that we need to learn 
a great deal of specialized information and processes for learning how to read and learning how to spell. The brain level question is, how does that happen? How does, that, how does the brain handle this specialized learning, especially given um, the relative um, uh, recentness of written language processing? And here there's been a considerable amount of debate about how the brain um, handles this specialized learning, with one hypothesis being that we have general purpose brain mechanisms for language, for vision, for attention, and reading and spelling recruit the brain areas that support these general purpose mechanisms, and that specialization occurs within um, these areas, um, within these areas that we have, our brains are designed um, to, um, to carry out. Another hypothesis is that the brain develops orthography-specific mechanisms, that you have brain areas that um, become specialized in these various components that are required for um, effective uh, reading and spelling. Now, how do we decide between these two hypotheses? You know, does the brain develop specialized brain areas, or do we use the general purpose brain areas for reading and spelling and just fine tune them? Um, it turns out that the study of brain lesions in literate adults provides a really strong test that helps us distinguish between these two hypotheses. Because if the brain areas that are involved in reading and spelling are general purpose areas, then if we find individuals who have suffered brain lesions that disrupt an orthographic skill, then we should also find that the related, the associated general skill should also be disrupted. If this general purpose brain area is used for reading and spelling, then a deficit in reading and spelling should be accompanied by a deficit in um, tasks that, other tasks that use the, the, the general skill. On the other hand, if the brain um, develop specialized neural areas for reading and spelling, then we might see that, there, that when these areas are damaged, they affect reading and spelling, but they need not affect other um, related uh, skills. And so in a study that we've uh, finished just recently, we examined a number of individuals who have what we call acquired dysgraphia. So this is spelling difficulties um, uh, acquired in adulthood. Um, uh, uh, after stroke for the most part in this study. Um, and it turns out that when you have a stroke that might affect your spelling, it, uh, it can affect different components of the spelling process. And I'm just going to tell you about one of the components of the spelling process that we looked at. And this is what we call orthographic working memory. So if I ask you to spell the word knife, you probably need to go into long-term memory to find the information that you've stored in long-term memory about the letters that make up that word, and then to produce the word um, either by writing it, by typing it, by putting icing on a cake, by drawing with your toe in the sand, however it is that you're going to produce that spelling, you need to hold on.
And so what we can conclude from that is that you can have an orthographic working memory impairment and not have other types of working memory impairment, suggesting that the brain has dedicated specific neural tissue to orthographic uh, working memory processes. Um, and, 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 and we're not using simply an all-purpose working memory system. So of course, learning to read and spell builds on pre-existing vision, language, working memory, and attention networks. In the child, that's what the child comes to the task with. And clearly, they use these systems to um, build their orthographic skills. But what these studies and other studies that Bruce mentioned also show is that the brain develops highly specialized regions for creating the multiple orthographically specialized components. And the idea is that these regions are um, within the what were originally general purpose areas and have particular properties. But neurons and neuronal groups within these areas are repurposed or recycled for orthographic purposes specifically. And finally, I'll talk about my third point, which is the, the claim that uh, we have lifelong neuroplasticity. We've talked um, almost entirely about learning in children today. And um, um, written language presents an opportunity um, to, to look at another aspect of learning. And one of the things that we uh, that may be different about written language and spoken language is the critical periods that Elizabeth talked about um, for spoken language may not apply uh, to written language. We know that illiterate adults can achieve literacy, so as an adult, literacy can be achieved. And intriguingly, individuals who have had strokes, um, there have been some reports that they, their improvement for written language may be greater than spoken language. Both of these suggest that this neuronal uh, repurposing or specialization for literacy may occur across the lifespan. In this study, we looked at individuals um, who had acquired dysgraphia from a left hemisphere stroke. We had extensive pre-training evaluation, three months of intensive spelling training, and then some post-evaluation at various uh, stages. What you see here simply is an example from one person, one word, the progression of improvement across time in their spelling of the word uh, prune. When we look at the group as a whole, what we find is that accuracy increases across training sessions, and it does so not only for the group, but also for each of the individuals, and also the speed of their responses gets faster um, with training. So people are, even many years after stroke, even for older individuals, you find that they're able to have recovery of written language functions. Now I want to be clear, I'm not saying that they completely recover their spelling, but you do have improvement even in this older uh, damaged brain. And when we look at, we, we place these participants in the scanner where they do spelling tasks before and after treatment, because one of the things that we want to understand is what's happening in the brain here? Okay, you have a lesion to the brain, and this, Im this part of the image um, represents the area of the brain that's lesioned in these group of participants. It's another overlay map where the lighter colors indicate the greatest areas of damage, and you can see that a large area of the orthographic processing network is damaged. What you see in the color here is that is the changes in activation from before to after treatment. And what you can, we know that they've improved, so we know there must be some kind of brain changes. Um, and what we find here, and this is what we call perilesional changes, which are changes near the lesion site. And we also find here changes within the orthographic processing network as well. And perhaps most interesting, we find that the, these different kinds of changes relate to the different types of deficits that these individuals have. So the perilesional changes is upregulation, this increase in activation from pre to post uh, treatment was what we found in those individuals that had the orthographic working memory deficits. In individuals that have deficits to other parts of the orthographic processing network, we find other patterns of recovery. So let me just um, summarize the three lessons, um, as you've now heard multiple times, and so hopefully, you know, that repetition is good. Um, uh, there is a major integration challenge um, for learning to read and spell. These are multi-component systems that in order to achieve expertise require um, integration. The brain um, is remarkable in that it is able to develop specialized regions dedicated to the particular subcomponents um, that are required for becoming an expert reader and speller, and the brain is able to uh, take advantage of a characteristic, at least in some areas of the brain, some parts of the brain, we'd like to understand which areas and why and under what circumstances, but there is evidence that we have lifelong uh, neuroplasticity, at least in certain areas and under certain um, circumstances that allow us to achieve literacy and recovery, um, even as adults. And so I'd like to thank uh, the members of my uh, research team and other collaborators, and uh, also to you. <laughs>
we have time for some questions. So, Brenda, I'm fascinated that the, um, <clears throat> the lesion area for orthographic uh, deficits is concentrated in the dorsal pathway and the parietal lobe, uh, less related to the visual word form area. So what's your interpretation of that and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, functions that are typically thought of uh, for the parietal lobe? So... Um, in this group that I'm showing you here, which is the, the group from the training study, you see these lesions that are concentrated, um, you know, not, uh, well, this is not the one you're talking about, right? You're talking about an orthographic working memory group here, so I'm gonna go back to that, yeah. Sorry. Study. yeah, yeah, this different study. This one, right? Okay. Yeah. So what you see is for the orthographic working memory group, you see this lesion in the left um, superior parietal area, but you can see that there are other uh, lesion areas also. So this is the, the classical fusiform, left fusiform gyrus area. And so we have another group of individuals that have lesions that concentrate in this area. These individuals' lesions do not extend into this area. They, they're, they're focused in this area. And they have a very different deficit profile. So they don't have orthographic working memory deficits. They have what we call lexical orthographic deficits. So remember when I said, oh, if I tell you to spell the word knife, you need to go into long-term memory to remember the spelling? These individuals have difficulty with that. When you ask them to spell words, they can't remember how a word is spelled. So they can't, they have difficulty going into long-term memory and retrieving the spelling of the word. They're not orthographic working memory difficulties. It doesn't matter how long the word is, how many letters it has. They, they, it, what actually matters is how frequent the word is, so how strong those long-term memory representations are. Is that, so, so different parts so, of the network. So what do you think the sort of traditional parietal uh, function is, is that here? we relate to orthographic? Yeah. So I think this is um, probably, this is, you know, working memory and serial attention, specifically in the context of something like reading or spelling. So if you, there are also reading studies that if you do, do not like just quick horizontal presentation of words, but if, for example, if you do vertical presentation of words, which we're not so used to seeing, you get activation in this area too. So, I mean, eventually you get good at vertical reading, but you need to do a serial allocation of attention even in reading um, if you do right, the, the right kind of stimulus presentation. And notice that this is left hemisphere, right? So I think that the reason why we're not seeing deficits in visual spatial working memory tasks is because the right hemisphere, these right hemisphere areas are able to perform those tasks. But these tasks, these areas in the left hemisphere really are specialized for this, this kind of unusual function. It's not, there aren't really very many tasks around. It's hard to think of anything where we really have elements whose spatial location needs to be remembered in exactly the, the you know, a certain precise order. It's a, it's a quite unusual function. But, yeah. We have time for that one more question. Um, just a quick question about your recent research. Uh, were there differences between a male subject versus female subjects, given that both genders handle emotional stressors differently, and that the fact that they had recently damaged brains? Did you find any differences? Well, we haven't, in terms of the, um, their, the brain response, in terms of recovery, or even the behavioral, their behavioral recovery, we haven't, we haven't, um, you know, we haven't distinguished the, the male and female group, so I can't give you a, a scientific answer. But I can tell you that we have males and females in this study. Everybody individually showed significant improvements in accuracy and, 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 and speed. So they're both responding well. Whether there are more subtle differences, I don't know. Thank you very much, Brenda.